All right, welcome back. This is part four of the ACC presentation for NATE certification for service technicians in air-to-air -air heat pumps. And in part four, we're going to talk about, believe it or not, heat pumps. The, um, the thing here is we're going to talk about heat pumps is things that are specific only to heat pumps. Prior to this, if you've been following the program, the first three sections, the stuff we were talking about could be applied to straight up air conditioning. So now we're going to get specific with the things in heat pumps that are specific to heat pumps. Again, our purpose is to get you ready to take and pass this exam successfully, the air to air heat pump exam in service. Uh, it's just progressive, so please be familiar with parts one, two, and three before you attempt part four. Suggested materials, pocket calculator is always a good idea. And again, we cannot assume liability for your application of the understanding nor the application uh, in the field. So, reversing valve, four-way. A reversing valve is, is in these types of reversing valves are called four-way valves. The number of ways a valve has are the number of pipes that connect to it. And you have three on this side and one on this side. That's four, obviously. If you have a zone valve, a typical hot water zone valve, and it just has, you know, it's a straight through zone valve where it has two connections, the, technically that's a two-way valve. If you have a diverting valve uh, or a mixing valve, it's at least a three-way valve. Okay, because it has three connections. It's either mixing two inputs, at least two inputs, and you have one output, or it's diverting where it takes an input and diverts it to two different locations. That's a three-way valve. This is a four-way valve. And they'll use that terminology in the exam. They'll call it a reversing valve in one instance, a uh, four-way valve in another instance, so be ready for that uh, multiple use. Okay. And essentially what's happening, like we looked at in the last section, is this slide is going to move back and forth. Here's the slide. We're in the, uh, not sure, I think we're in the heating position here. It doesn't matter. Uh, what I want you to be familiar with is this, the way this works. Now, uh, attached, and we've separated it here so you can see it. In fact, I didn't separate this. The good people from train who gave me this slide did. Now, we have capillary tubes. This piece is actually mounted right on a valve, but it's difficult to see it that way. So they took it off the valve and spread it out so it makes more sense. Essentially, what's going to happen? The gas is going to, at some point in time, enter either uh, enter or exit in this uh, in this slide. This, this uh, I don't know what to call it. This cylinder part, where the rest of the gas is going to be surrounding the cylinder. Now, when the gas enters the cylinder, if it's high-pressure gas, you see this slide. Now, picture this whole thing is round. So this thing looks like a plunger, if you will, on this end, and a plunger, if you will, on this end. And you see you have the slots in here. So when the high-pressure gas from the high side of the system, the compressor discharge, comes into here, the gas, if 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 this is low pressure, the gas leaks through here, fills up this void, and slides the valve to the left. Now, the reason that happened is this is attached to the other side, the differential pressure. All right, and that fills up and pushes that over. Of the four pipes, this one the one in the alone on it by its side, uh, the, the only one on this side, is always, always, and this is on a test, connected to the compressor discharge. Of the three on the other side, the one in the center is always, always connected to the suction side, the, the low side, the true low side of the system. Either the accumulator, the true suction line, if you don't have an accumulator, whatever the case is. These other two things just switch the entering gas from uh, uh, high to low, you know, or inside to outside. That, that's all they do. That's their only function. If the charge is low, the reversing valve may not slide or move because you don't have a low side. 
you don't have a high side. And there's, if there's no differential pressure because your pressure is low, then it's not going to move. Now, we moved it the other way. This is still connected to the compressor discharge, the discharge line from the compressor. This is still connected to the true suction line. And we just diverted where the gas is going to go. When it comes back from this coil, it's going to go back to the compressor through this line, where before it was coming back this way and going through the compressor. Now you'll see this is the low side, and this is the high side. And now this time when this gas entered here, it bled through here and filled up this cylinder, which was stopped off, and this became your high side. This was open to the low side, so any gas that entered here just bled out through that hole. And that whole thing, because this pressure was higher than this pressure, forced this to slide to the right. And now the gas coming back from the outdoor coil is going to be returned to the compressor, where before the gas from the indoor coil was being returned to the compressor. So no, all this is just open. It's just a cylinder. And if you cut one of these open, you'll see it's lined with white Teflon. And this is just a slide. It's just another cylinder, a smaller one within a cylinder attached to these, I'm going to call them um, uh, plugs because that's what they look like. And, you know, everything slides along this Teflon lining because Teflon is great that way. Uh, if you slide something across it, you actually create like a grease by the movement of the slide so it's not going to hang up. The thing I want to be concerned with here is that when you start brazing these fittings and you don't completely heat sink this, this main body, you're going to melt that Teflon inside, and that's the, the occasion under which this thing will never slide. Reversing valves, and I'm going to say something that's not totally true, but true 99.9% .9 of the time. Reversing valves don't go bad. And the reason they don't go bad is, I mean, the solenoids go bad, bad, all that jazz. But they don't go bad because there's no moving parts. You have a slide inside here that's going to move a total of maybe an inch, inch and a half. You know, what's the, and it's, it's right, it's embedded in, in uh, surrounded by Teflon. It's going to give it a nice flow, a nice movement. What is it that's going to go bad exactly? I mean, eventually, over time, if this thing is installed for 200 years, the friction from the movement of the refrigerant is going to ruin it, but that's not going to happen in the lifetime of the equipment. So whenever I get a guy that brings back, when I was in wholesaling, and he would bring back a reversing valve from a brand new heat pump saying, ah, oh, this piece of junk, you know, the heat pump went bad, we would either expect to see where he had completely overheated this thing and distorted this tube, or if the tube looked good and he had ins it was installed correctly, we could be guaranteed, especially on a new unit that he didn't have to install, that he was probably low on gas, and that's why it didn't slide. It had nothing to do with the uh, actual operation of it. And we used to actually have a little pool going to figure out how long it would take the guy after he left the shop with a new reversing valve to get back, reinstall the reversing valve, and get the thing running again to realize he was, in fact, short on gas. It just, the, and I was 13 years in wholesaling and spent a lot of time at the counter helping people out and being a counterman at one point in time early on. Uh, you see this happen on a regular basis. You get pretty uh, familiar with what does happen. Anyway, if the valve is leaking under this slide, if there does develop a gap in here somehow, then the pressures will tend to equalize, because look what you got here. here here's your uh, slide. That's, that's one pressure. The other pressure, the lower, higher pressure, is on the outside of it. So if there's a leak in here anywhere, the high and low are going to equalize, or tend to equalize. Your low pressure is going to get high. Your high pressure is going to get low. That's a typical symptom of a, a leaky sliding, excuse me, a leaky slide inside of a reversing valve. This is also from Train, my friends at Train, and this is a, uh, a good test you can make on a reversing valve to find out whether or not it did complete its slide and whether or not there is a leak somewhere. Because if you're in this position where the indoor coil is uh, receiving the hot gas, then you take your laser thermometer, and that's a perfect application for it, and you check the 
discharge line going in, and you check the line going out to the indoor coil if that's you're in the heating mode. Then you'll and the, the, this temperature and this temperature, if it slid properly, should be plus or minus five degrees. The same with this one. This line going back to the accumulator should be almost the same temperature as the one coming back from the outdoor coil in the winter time. If it's not, these are tending to look more and more like each other, then that's one indication that it might be leaking or did not completely slide because of a lack of pressure. In the cooling mode, same thing happens. Discharge gas now is going outside. Return gas is coming from the indoor coil. But again, this temperature and this temperature should be awful close to each other. They're saying 5 degrees. Yeah, well within 5 degrees. 5 degrees would be the outside, the maximum. But a great application for a laser thermometer. Don't use laser thermometers for superheater subcooling. The temperature of the pipe has to be shielded from the ambient temperature. So if you just point this on a 95 degree day at a suction line, the 95 degrees is affecting the suction line temperature. You need to put a surface pyrometer on that suction line and insulate it so that it, it's not affected by the ambient temperature. Let's talk about defrost. In the old days, Ranko made a living selling us defrost controls and probably still do. And that was a damn good control but it was a little different than a lot of the stuff you see today in some regards. First of all, defrost takes place not at 32 degrees. Because at 32 degrees, there's not a whole lot of moisture in the air to condense on the cold outdoor coil in the wintertime. In fact, if there's anything in the air at 32 degrees, it ain't moisture. It's a solid we call ice most of the time. I know there's exceptions, but I'm talking about the rule, not the exception here. Now, the outdoor coil temperature, the outdoor coil is always has to be anywhere from, where did I lose my cursor? Here it is. Has to be anywhere from 10, has to be anywhere from 10 to 15 degrees colder than the outdoor temperature. If it's not, it can't absorb heat from the outdoor. When the outdoor temperature and the coil temperature are the same, there's no heat transfer. So this has to be colder, and hot goes to cold, and it can absorb heat from the outdoor temperature. Remember, there's no such thing as cold until you get to 459.6 below zero. So on a 40-degree, 30-degree night, there's plenty of heat in the air for this coil, if it's colder than the outside, to absorb from. At about 40 degrees outdoor temperature, that coil's 30, maybe even 25 degrees. So right between, you know, and it varies uh, depending on the, the area too, but right, right around 35 to 55, definitely 40 degrees uh, up to about 50, maybe even 55 degrees is when most defrost is going to happen. When it gets really cold, you, you're, there's no moisture in the air to condense in the coil, so it's not an issue. Unless it, you happen to get a rainstorm, which would then be an ice storm. So that's the most commonly occurring time to have defrost, 40, 45, maybe even 50 degrees, because at any of those temperatures, this coil is going to be at or below freezing. So if there's the nights I used to, uh, to hate, I ran a company in Point Pleasant Beach, and at one point in time, we had a lot of heat pumps along the ocean. And on a 45-degree night, if we had a, a layer that rolled in off the ocean, a fog that rolled in off the ocean because the ground was warmer or something like that and the cold air came off the I would I'd be up all night. I know it would be because we'd have call after call after call about frozen up outdoor units. And people, if they haven't experienced it before, don't know what that is. All they know is their outdoor unit is on fire because it's smoking. And, of course, that's what it looks like when you go into defrost because you get the steam, that plume of steam that, uh, as the hot gas goes out there and starts to melt the ice on a 40-degree night. So those were, those were terrible. There's a lot of uh, cap the, moist the air is very capable of having a lot of moisture at 45 and 50 degrees. That's gonna, all of it, as it hits that outdoor coil, is going to condense like a, like a son of a gun. In order to sense that this coil has built up with ice, we use one of two methods. 
actually one of three methods, but the two primary methods are, are temperature and pressure. We're going to sense the difference in temperature between the liquid line. Let me find my cursor. It's right down here. The liquid line right there and the ambient temperature. And when this temperature, as the accumulation of ice on a, a coil, as ice accumulates on a coil, and the temperature drops, the difference between the ambient temperature and the coil temperature increases. And when it does, if you have two sensors here, like on this Ranko control, when that difference is great enough, depending on how this system is set up, then it will initiate a defrost cycle. Let me go on with this. This ambient sensor should be in the airstream coming into the unit, not in the discharge airstream, because the discharge airstream is going to be colder you know, during the heating season than the inlet airstream is going to be. The inlet airstream is the actual temperature of the air entering this coil, and that's what we want to know, what temperature of air is entering this coil. So that's where that needs to be positioned. I don't mean it has to sit outside, but it has to be somewhere where it can represent that influx, not on the inside of the unit, on the other side of the coil, because that's too late. The coil's already changed the temperature of the air. It has to be external to sense that temperature. Okay, but it's in the inlet airstream. This is what I wanted to say. Now we can look at pressure. Another way to do this is to look at a pressure difference, because as the ice builds up on the outdoor coil, and the outdoor coil is all we're concerned with here, the, the difference in pressure will increase. As the coil becomes completely ice blocked and no air gets through it, your difference is as large as it will ever be. And at some time, hopefully before that, this control is set up to sense that and will initiate a defrost cycle. The only thing is, you know, the newer pumps, uh, heat pumps, do this on demand. In fact, Train, American Standard, have an excellent system for on demand defrost. But in the old days, you had a setting. It was set for like 30, 60, 90 minutes. And you, you move this neurally knob to a position where after 30 minutes, let's say you set it for 30 minutes, after 30 minutes of runtime, it would look to see if you had this pressure difference or temperature difference. And if you did, it would initiate a defrost cycle and reset the time clock for another 30 minutes. But it's not 30, 60, 90 minutes of time, chronological time. In other words, if you set it for 30 minutes, it wouldn't look at it at 10 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock. It would look at it after 30 minutes of run time. This would calculate the run time. If the unit came on and ran for 15 minutes, it's got 15 minutes. Then the unit came on and ran for 5 minutes and shut off. Now it's got 20 minutes of run time. And then it came on again and ran for 30 minutes, Okay, uh, 10 minutes. Okay, now you've got 30 minutes. Now it will take a look at the temperature, pressure, whatever it's responding to, and initiate a defrost cycle, but not before. Once a defrost cycle is initiated, all defrost will be terminated when those conditions of pressure and temperature are reversed or, if they're not, when 10 to 15 minutes have expired. Train, I believe, uses allows it to go for 15 minutes. Other manufacturers, a lot of them are 10 minutes, but no more than that. Why? Well, when you go into and the new circuit boards are exactly the same way. You have to set that timing up. You tell it how often you want it to look at it. The reason you don't want to stay in defrost more than 10 or 15 minutes is very simple. When you go into defrost, three things happen. You put the reversing valve in the air conditioning position, the cooling position, so that the hot gas goes outside. Simultaneously, you cut off the outdoor fan because we're trying to let the heat penetrate the ice in that coil and if we bring the fan on, we're going to blow cold air over that ice and refreeze it. So it's kind of dumb. If you shut the fan off, you'll shorten the length of the defrost cycle. And it's important to defrost it because we're in the cooling mode. We're blowing 60, 50 degree air on people in the middle of winter when it's 40 degrees outside. The other thing that happens because of that, we're going to energize some strip heat. Most systems are built this way. There is an exception. I handled a brand of heat pumps that were made in the United States. 
back in the 70s, 75, 80, and I uh, was working for a wholesaler at the time. And when you bought there, and it was a major brand, and when you bought their heat pump, you had to buy a separate kit that would bring the strip heat on in defrost mode. And the reason they did that, they tried to pull the slicky. They thought if they didn't energize the um, strip heat during defrost cycle, and they submitted that to ARI as their test results, then they would, their COP would be higher and the HSPF would be higher because this amount of energy never came into play. It was an option you had to buy. And the contractor had it was a plug-in. You had to plug into the circuit board. That's that's the old days. Okay. Nowadays everybody does this because people are. Uh, I think the manufacturers have improved the product to the point where they comfort is more important. I think than uh, efficiency. At least it should be with anybody with any sense of decency in, in my mind. Balance point. Let's talk about balance point. There are multiple balance points in a system, but understand the basic thermal balance point. Here's the building heat loss line right here. When it's 70 degrees outside, this is outdoor temperature. When it's 70 degrees outside, how much heat do you need? These are MBH, thousands of BTU, 60,000 BTU, no BTU. Well, when it's 70 degrees out, you don't need any. So let's put a mark right there. Now, if this is a 5-ton heat pump, when do you need all 60,000 BTUs? When it's 0 degrees out, right, or 5 below, whatever the case is. So you put a point there. And then you do what any good engineer does. You extrapolate. You, you, uh, because, and you can do this because this is a linear relationship. As it gets colder outside, you need more and more heat. There is absolutely no question about that. You're not going to end up with a reality line that's going to be skewed or curved or have highs and lows. It's almost dead straight. That's the heat loss of the building. Now, let's oppose that with the inverse of that. We have a heat pump. At 70 degree outdoor temperature, the heat pump will give you 100% of the of its capacity and if it's a five ton heat pump it's going to give you 60,000 BTUs of heat and you know again nominally 60,000 BTUs of cooling it's an air conditioning unit it's going to give you the same heat as it gives you cooling it's just going to reverse where the hot gas goes you know in the summertime the hot gas going outside the summertime going the hot gas is going inside so we got point here now when it's zero degrees outside the heat pump has no capacity. It's useless because the air is way, way too cold. And there, there, there's, there's no heat left in the air to extract. We can't, using R22, we can't get the temperature of that coil below zero. Not with R22. Okay, not with today's heat pumps. So this is also, we draw a straight line because it is quite linear. As it gets colder outside, the capacity of the heat pump reduces linearly to the point where it has no capacity. So now, where these two lines, the heat pump capacity and the building requirement cross each other, that is the balance point. At that point in time, the heat loss of the building and the capacity of the heat pump are exactly, theoretically, the same. So at, in this case here, it turns out to be, I believe it's about 36 degrees Fahrenheit. So the heat pump alone can carry us right down to 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, what do we do when it drops down to 25 degrees? We add strip heat. And if I add 5 kW of strip heat, I multiply 5 by 3413, 3413, that's the BTUs in a watt. And I get about, I think it's about 18,000 BTUs. I draw a line parallel with this first line, the building heat loss, and I measure up from this point to 18,000 BTUs, and up this point to 18,000 BTUs, draw a straight line. Now my new balance point is right here, and it's 26 degrees Fahrenheit. If the temperature outside continues to drop, I need to add 5K more. I measure up 18,000. You know, 5 times 3 is 18, 5K. Measure up 18,000, draw a straight line. My new balance point is 14 degrees. 
Okay, my, my new balance point is 14 degrees. All right? So what do I do? If the temperature drops below 14, 18,000 more BTUs in the form of 5KW. Now my third balance point is going to be about 5 degrees Fahrenheit. And I can actually do this once I've done the heat loss and heat gain in a building. I know what this line is, and I've chosen a heat pump. Because the manufacturer's data will give you heating values at two points, 47 degrees and 17 degrees. That's the two points you put in a graph. Draw the straight line. Now you'll know exactly what temperature you're going to need to add the first stage of heat. So what do you use this number for? That's the setting of your first outdoor thermostat. You shouldn't need it before that point. This becomes the setting of the next outdoor thermostat, 14 degrees, and this is the last outdoor thermostat that will allow this to come on. The only time you need the outdoor thermostats is when you're paying electric based on peak load. If you could if you can keep this peak offline, you're going to save a whole lot of money in your electric bill. Certain utility companies charge you for the peak. They look at your usage across the month, find the highest peak value, and charge you that rate for the whole month's kilowatt usage. That's peak rate. If you're in a peak rate area, you better get outdoor thermostats on your heat pump. If you're not in the peak rate area, it probably doesn't matter. And you could truly bring them all out once. Whether you run 10 kW for 5 minutes or 20 kW for 2.5 minutes costs you the same. It's pi. The power you use in watts is equal to the volts times the amps. All right? times the time. All right, where do you put this outdoor unit? The outdoor unit. Don't call it a condensing unit. I heard you say condenser. No, it's an outdoor unit. Okay, it's a heat pump. The outdoor unit must be located so that the defrost runoff can be drained away from the unit. If not drained away, the runoff will cause a buildup of ice on the bottom part of the coil and reduce system capacity. All right, when ice is there, you don't get any heat transfer, so your capacity is going to go in the dumper. So it should be elevated, even in warm climates. And I'm not talking about southern Florida. I mean in warmer climates where the winter is not so severe. But in other climates, you know, you may have to get this thing up on stand. You've got to be above not the snowfall line, but the drift line for the position this thing is in. And it's always a good idea to have a gravel pit here. You know, dig down about a foot or so, fill that area with gravel, bring it up level, and then set your frame or whatever you're doing on top of that. So any water runoff drains right away. It doesn't get held up and lay, puddle up around the thing and start building up and building up. If you're close to the ground like this and the ground is hard because it's cold outside, you know, you get a frost line and you get a 40 degree day and a lot of defrost, it, it'll, it'll run off and collect here and then freeze. And then the next time it runs off, it'll freeze on top of that. And pretty soon you got a stepping stone working up to block this coil off. So you want to get it up. And you want to have a place for the water to run off and be taken away quickly. Outdoor unit location considerations. Now, what we're going to talk about here applies to air conditioning condensers as well, but it's particularly important for heat pumps. Proper air circulation. Clearances. Don't do this, especially if the back of this is the service panel. Because there's no way in the world you're going to get in there and work on a compressor. You're going to end up taking this whole frame apart because you've got to go in from the top. Use your head. Give yourself room to work. For my money, you should take the back of this and turn it around and face it out here so your serviceman never has to be stuck between a, a wall and the face of this unit. Noise transmission. Don't be putting it under windows where people sleep. They're going to hear it. If they can see it move, they can hear the noise from it, even if it's insulated from the structure. All right, That glass is thin. Even if it's double glass, it's two eighth inch, in, eighth inch thick, thin pieces of glass. It's not going to stop noise.
any more than it stops light from coming in. Convenience to piping and electrical service. Yeah, of course that's important, but that shouldn't be the first thing you think about. Future service. Serviceman got to get in there. Uh, natural water and roof drainage. Don't put it under a roof overhang. Even if it has a gutter, try to get on the side of the house that doesn't have the roof overhang. Uh, the reason is debris, especially in hard rainstorms, will wash everything down into here. If you have an ice storm, all that stuff's going to run off and get clogged. It's going to destroy this fan blade. The fan blade will lock up. You'll have leaves in there. You'll have a pile of leaves. You'll have uh, sticks will come off the roof and they'll run down there and they'll stand up and you know uh, the fan will come on and it'll, it'll jam and the motor will burn up. Get away from the house as much as possible or the overhang of the house. Solar influence. Get it out of the sun if you can. If you've got a choice between the north and the south side of the house and they're both equal except for the fact that one faces south, one faces north, by all means, take the north because you'll, you'll be more efficient in the summertime. Appearance, that should be the customer. This is number one. To me, it's number I don't care, and I'm going to tell you where it should go, and if you want to put it someplace else, fine. But don't mount it on the front porch, of course, and don't put it in the front of the house. All right. Avoid alcoves inside corners like this one. When air moves into an alcove, it becomes dead. It stops, and you don't get good airflow over this coil like you want. Roof overhangs, of course, and windows because of noise. Package heat pump. Here's a package heat pump on the ground. All right, here's a commercial building here. All right, or maybe it's a residence, whatever. But you mount it on a slab. Make darn sure that slab is isolated from the building so it doesn't transfer the vibration and the noise to the building. Now here, you know, with a ductwork, it's fairly rigidly attached, so you need to have flexible connections at some point so that this doesn't transmit the noise directly to the house. Package T pumps have the advantage of being generally less expensive to install than similar size split systems. A split system, you got an air handler, I don't know, in the attic, in the basement, you got a Condense, an outdoor unit outside. You got a line set in between. You got all the labor it takes to assemble that. Where this is all done already. Your indoor coil, outdoor coil, air handler, are all in one piece. So it's it's definitely cheaper per ton to use a package unit than a split system, and that's true for air conditioning as well, cooling. Roof curb. Make certain that the roof can support the added weight. Know which way the beams are running and make sure that your mounting is perpendicular to that. Make sure that it can take the load. If you're in doubt, bring a structural engineer in, mechanical engineer. The guy would be very happy to charge you uh, four or five hundred dollars to look at it and tell you it's good or bad or whatever they charge. And the curb gasket, make sure that's put around the frame, uh, the, the curb, before the unit gets mounted on it so that you don't have a metal-to-metal -metal connection. You know what the curb is. Curb uh, gasket is. That's that piece of foam rubber with sticky back that's usually laid on the uh, roof somewhere and it's blowing around in the, on the rooftop. It makes a heck of a difference on noise transmission. Heat pump thermostat. Let's talk about that for a minute. Heat pump thermostat. Preferred thermostat location is near a return grill. And when you make that statement, what you're saying is don't mount it right next to the return grill. Because you're going to get a lot of dirt in it, for one thing, that's entra entrained in the airstream, uh, a lot of dust. Uh, what they're saying is put it in a place near where the return air grill is because that's the point of negative pressure in the room and that's probably a good place to find the average temperature of the room because if you got three or four rooms five rooms six rooms that are servicing one central return then the average temperature for all those rooms will be seen right at the entrance to the return grill because the return grill is the point of negative pressure in the in the area that the air, the supply air, will move to. 
because it's lower pressure. It doesn't move at the speed of light, but it moves there at usually terminal velocity, about 25 feet per minute. When you get within 30 to 36 inches of that grill, the return grill, then you feel the effects of it. Take a, a candle, light it, get three feet away from the noisiest, fiercest, suckinest return grill you can find, get three feet away, and the light in that candle standing straight up. And as you go closer and closer to the grill, the light of the candle leans more and more into the, uh, into the grill. That's the effective area. But it is a point of negative pressure, and air will move to it. So it's a good representative sample of the air. A system switch set in auto. The system switch, not the fan switch. The system switch is the thing that has heat, cool, emergency heat, all that. If you set that in auto, that means that thermostat has the capability of switching between heating and cooling automatically when the need arises. And there's always a dead band, a null, N-U-L-L, -L, degree that's built into it. Usually it's like 5 degrees, so the lowest, let's say the lowest setting you can have and the highest setting you can have are at least 5 degrees apart. So nothing happens in that 5 degree range. But when the temperature continues to rise, gets past that 5 degrees, then the cooling's going to come on. And when it drops and satisfies and the temperature continues to fall 5 degrees below that set point, it'll bring on the, the heating. That's the way auto works. Some thermostats have a seat terminal. Some of them have a seat terminal and a battery backup. If they have a seat terminal and no battery backup, you probably have to bring the common wire from the transformer to the thermostat. So now you've got both sides of the transformer up there. You've got R, and now you're going to need C. And the reason you're going to do that is if the thermostat has an LED display, this is an old, I think it's a TH-72, it's ancient. No lights, bells, or whistles, none of that jazz, so you don't need it. But the new modern uh, digital electronic thermostats, just about all of them require that. If they don't have the C terminal, they have a battery backup, and the battery is lighting the display and the, the red lights and the green light, blue lights and all that jazz that come on when you're in emergency heat or you go into defrost or whatever indicators they have. But if the C terminal needs to be hooked up, it's because you have to have both sides of low voltage power up there to light those lights and display the display. Understand that a two-stage thermostat, a heat pump, two-stage heating thermostat, the first stage brings on the compressor the second stage brings on the first stage of backup heat. And what brings it on? The demand. In other words, you set the room for 70 degrees, and the temperature in the room, and the heat pump is running, and the temperature in the room drops, and this is a heating season, temperature in the room drops to a degree and a half or so below 70, it pulls the second stage thermostat in. And the second stage thermostat pulls in the strip heat, and that should bring heat on into the room. If it continues to drop, it'll pull the next stage in, and so on and so forth. Providing the thermostat, the outdoor thermostats have been made. And the reason, another reason you use outdoor thermostats is you, to avoid peak load. What people do, they treat, unfortunately, they treat heat pumps like they were gas furnaces. They come in from the outside on a 20-degree day, and they go in the house, and the house is in setback mode because they've been at work all day, and the house is maybe uh, 60 degrees, 65 degrees, and they go, oh, i got to chill, and they, they turn the thermostat up to 90. Well, if you don't have outdoor thermostats, when you turn that up to 90, you pulled all the backup heat in. But if you stage it across the outdoor thermostats, then it won't... The, the heat you don't need won't come on until you need it. It might take a few more minutes to warm the house up, but the difference is a, a big electric bill or a small electric bill. Heat anticipators. Some of the old thermostats had these. Some of them would have them on the first stage and the second stage of heat. Some would only have it on the first stage and it would be a fixed anticipator for the second stage. When it comes to Heat pump thermostats, it's really important.
that you get the manufacturers. When you're going to replace a thermostat on a unit you're not familiar with, I'm making up a name here. It's a York unit, and you don't work on York, get the model number of the indoor unit and the model and serial number of the outdoor unit. Go to York and say, look, this is what I got. What thermostat do I need? Don't just go take a, a generic two-stage heating, one-stage cooling off the shelf. It may not work well. And if you get it to work right in one season, it may not work for beams in the other season. And the reason has to do mostly with heat anticipation setting. Honeywell used to make a book. It was a catalog. It was, I'd say, a half inch to three-quarter inches thick. And all it was was a listing of all the different heat pump thermostats they make for the different manufacturers. And it showed you the, some detail of what was different about them. And it was almost always, uh, the book had, I'll bet you it had two, three hundred pages in it. Uh, that's how different they are. And it, is it, you know, you might get lucky and, and take an off-the-shelf replacement that's only slightly different, or you might take an off-the-shelf replacement and it's so different it you hardly get what you want. You'll be eight degrees off room setting relative to when the unit comes on. So what I want to show you here is very basic. If this were, here's a T87F, the heating anticipator on all thermostats is in series with the load. So the heating anticipator, once the, once the thermostat drops and calls for heat, and you have current going through here, I'm showing a gas valve, this anticipator then, depending on how you've adjusted it, it's right there. You have this stylus. The stylus is attached to this arm, which is going to move up and down on that, resi uh, that rheostat. And, of course, if you move this all the way up here, you've added a lot of resistance and, therefore, a lot of heat. If this stylus is moved all the way down here, you virtually have no resistance, and you're not going to add a lot of heat. The heat anticipator's job is to sense, to give the thermostat, false heat. Look where this thing, it takes up this space here. Now look where that is. That's right under the temperature sensor that's behind this dial setting. So its job is to throw heat on that device to make it think that the room is actually hotter than it already is. And the reason you're doing that is, think about it, this is on, the thermostat's mounted on the inside wall. If you're doing it right, you're supplying your heat on the outside wall, which is where you're gaining and losing all your heat. So that's a good place to put it. Now, by the time that heat gets all the way across the room and affects a thermostat on the inside wall, you will have grossly overheated the, the, the air in that room. So the anticipator can't bring the, the thermostat on, but once the thermostat calls, it shuts it off at the appropriate time if you've measured the amp draw in the system. What you need to do to set heat anticipator, and this is the breakdown here, basically what you're going to do, you're going to hook up one wire to R, you're going to take your clamp on amp probe, wrap around the jaws of the amp probe, you're going to take exactly 10 turns and put the other end of that wire, insulated thermostat wire, on W. Thermostat's off the wall, you just got the sub base. You're going to wait until the heat comes up in the building. If it's baseboard, wait till you hear the baseboard start to expand and you feel heat in the registers. If it's hot air, wait till the fan comes on and starts blowing hot air. Because you don't want to see the instantaneous reading. You want to know what this thing is going to, how much amperage this is going to generate while it's running. Because that's when it comes into play, and that's what's going to cause this to shut off. Once you've done that, let's say your amp probe goes, uh, the lowest scale you have goes from 1 to 6 amps and you do the 10 turns, okay? Now, when you, when you take the reading, it's going to say, f for instance, 4 amps, okay? You're on a 6 amp, 0 to 6 amp scale, and it's going to deflect the 4 amps, 3, three quarters of the way up. What that says is you've got a 4 amp draw, but you've got to divide it by the 10 turns, which means your amp draw, move the decimal point one place, is actually 0.4. That's why you use 10 turns. If you use 9 turns, you've got to divide the, the 4 amp reading by 9. If you have 4, you've got to divide it by 4. It becomes a little awkward. 10 is nice because whatever number you read, just put the decimal point in the other side of the number. And that's what you set the heat anticipator at. If you read 12 amps, you set the heat anticipator on 1.2. 
move the move the decimal point one place from from behind the two to between the one and the two. All right, that's how it works. But you got to read the amp draw of the heating circuit. You can't just say, oh, let me see. The gas valve says 0.4. Yeah, that's the amp draw of the gas valve, not all the wiring and all this other stuff. You do you have five feet of thermostat wire or do you have 50? Makes a heck of a difference in the setting of the anticipator. Cooling anticipator. Cooling anticipator is not in series. It's in parallel with the load. It does the same thing. It anticipates the fact that you're going to need cooling because the room is getting hotter. And it fakes out the thermostat, the call, when, when, it, when if it waited for the room temperature, it wouldn't. Because it's in there all the time, it's constantly generating heat on the uh, thermostat mechanism. The heating anticipator is not the cooling anticipator, and it is not an adjustable anticipator. It is a fixed resistor in the subbase. And this anticipator doesn't do what the other one did, the heating anticipator did, in that it won't shut it off sooner, but it will bring it on sooner. It really has no control over shutting it off. So if you're having trouble maintaining the temperature in the, on the cooling side, but not the heating side, don't replace the thermostat, because you'll get a new heating anticipator and leave the old bad cooling anticipator in the subbase. You got to replace the subbase. Add-on heat pumps. What's an add-on heat pump? Well, an add-on heat pump is added onto another furnace, an existing fossil fuel, whatever furnace gas, oil, maybe it's a coal burner, whatever, you added the heat pump on top of typically a fossil fuel furnace. Maybe this is a 97% efficient gas furnace. They're showing an oil, oil furnace here. So it's an 85% efficient oil furnace. And you put a heat pump on top of it because there's a economic balance point that will tell you when it's cheaper to run the electric heat pump at a you know a COP of I don't know three whatever you set, whatever you got an HSPS of seven, or run the oil at 85 percent efficiency. If you're going to do that, forget about all that other junk. But if you're going to add on to it, you're going to add a heat pump onto a fossil fuel furnace. You must have a control that does not allow the furnace and the heat pump to both be in the heating mode at the same time. So when the furnace comes on, the heat pump has to shut off. Because what are you doing when the heat pump is running? You're sending hot gas into a coil. And when you've got hot gas in there, you're creating a high pressure. What are you going to do? Bring the furnace on and now bring 140 degree air over that already hot coil? You're going to create all kinds of problems. So you want to make darn sure that when this furnace comes on, that heat pump shuts off. So you either run 100% furnace or 100% in the heating mode. 100% furnace or 100% heat pump, but never both. Okay? And all manufacturers make it for their products. And it is quite product specific. Low pressure switch. Where can you expect to find a low pressure switch? Well, a low pressure switch placed in a suction line will do two things. It'll detect a loss of charge because the pressure dropped, then you don't the pressure drops, your refrigerant level probably dropped along with it. And it will also take the compressor offline if the pressure drops too low to keep it from uh, flooding back liquid or whatever the case is and busting up the suction line but uh, the suction valves on the compressor. Looks like this typically. Uh, the wires that feed the contactor outside, I've oversimplified this. This is an air conditioning system, but it works the same way. You'll have a high pressure switch, uh, excuse me, a low pressure switch in series with the contact coil. And when it, it senses a low pressure, in this case, it's going to open up and drop out the contactor. 24 volts will be lost here, and the compressor will shut down, and it will save the compressor from damage. Electronic air cleaners, air cleaners in general. Let's talk about them. We'll talk about electronic, and we'll talk about media filters. If you have an EAC, an electronic air cleaner, you improve the air IAQ, the indoor air quality. Any of these filters improves the indoor air quality. Now, if you have a media filter or an electronic air cleaner, 
as the media filter or the electronic efficiency increases, particle size decreases, pressure drop increases. The simplest way to think about this is this. Replace this media filter in your mind with a chain link fence. Now the dirt coming down the pike is the size of bowling balls. And you know as well as I do, you can throw as many bowling balls as you want to against a chain link fence and ain't none of them going to go through. So you are at that point in time for that size particle 100% efficient. But what happens when you get a whole bunch of bowling balls? This, the opening between bowling balls, because they're stacked on top of each other and shoulder to shoulder, that opening becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. What, what does that create? Well, the next time the particle size is going to decrease, because the next time somebody throws something smaller, like golf balls, at this chain link fence, most of which would have gone right through, but now because of the larger bowling ball particles, most of them won't go through. All right, so your particle size gets smaller, your efficiency has increased because of that, but the pressure drop, because the holes available for air to go through are smaller, the pressure drop increases. You understand all that? Now, if you want to back up and say, okay, I want to make this thing a uh, chain link fence, and I ain't throwing bowling balls at it, I'm going to throw golf balls. Well, you know, about half the golf balls are going to go through, and about half are going to bounce back, but... Uh, in the real world, they don't get to bounce back. They, they'll just impinge. They call it viscous impingement. They'll impinge. They'll be pressed up against that media filter, and more and more will collect. And the size, the opening, the, the air flow through this will get smaller and smaller. The air flow will reduce because the pressure will increase. So you have the same symptoms. It just takes longer for it to happen. Electronic air cleaners, while we're talking about them, the ionization wires generate somewhere between 4,000 and 8,000 volts DC. I know this is plugged into 120 volt AC, but we got four uh, diodes working in there, and we're rectifying the AC to DC, and then we've stepped it up across the transformer. We've amplified it. Odors can only be removed by a charcoal pre-filter in your electronic air cleaner. The question you're going to get is something like this. What do electronic air filters take out of the air? They take out uh, dog hair. They take out pollen. Uh, they take out, uh, I'm trying to think of what else, oh, dust. And they take out odors. No, they don't. They don't take out odors. All right? They can't. The only thing that removes odors is charcoal. If you've got a garage that's starting to smell like the dogs you used to keep in there, take take charcoal, regular charcoal like you're going to use on your barbecue and take something like a, a garbage can and sprinkle the charcoal around it and put it in four corners of the garage and the charcoal will actually absorb the odor out of the air. If you go in the old timer, and I've had to do this in, in places when I bought places where they kept dogs like that and it, it absolutely works. You'll go in an old timer's house sometimes, some old guy like me and you'll go down the basement and you'll see that. You'll see pile of, piles of charcoal in different points of the basement. He's trying to absorb the uh, moist, uh, that, that mildew odor you get in basements, that damp, ba that damp odor. If you're looking at a house and you're trying to buy it and you go in the basement and you see those charcoals, they have an odor problem. It might be mold, mildew, could be something insignificant, but the charcoal is there to absorb the odor they don't want you to smell. Attic installation. Let's take an air handler and put it in the attic. Um, this is a fan coil unit. Got a fan and a coil. All right. A couple things you have to be concerned with here. First of all, we're going to need a secondary drain pan because if God forbid this, these two lines clog up, water is going to overflow in that pan, uh, the primary pan, and it's going to go into the secondary. Uh, if the secondary is not there, it's going to hit the ceiling and you're going to lose your ceiling. It'll fill up with water. You'll start to see water marks in the ceiling, and the next thing you know, that part of the ceiling will come crashing down. And I don't mean the whole ceiling at once. I'm talking about, a, you know, a, depending on how much water there is. It could be a 14-inch round piece of ceiling is just going to drop straight down. Seen it happen too many times. 
So, you know, hang the thing from the rafters, uh, you know, use, uh, uh, what do they call them, seismic springs or whatever if vibration is really a problem. But if you at least hang it from the rafters, most of the vibration will be absorbed by, your, by the roof line, and it won't transfer to the walls. Now, you need two lines. You need a condensate line from the main pan. You need two condensate lines from the main pan. The first line is the primary line, and it is, let me back up, it is below the secondary line, okay? The primary line needs to be trapped, because if you don't have a water trap here, and this blower starts up, this pan is on the negative side of the blower. The point of greatest negative pressure in the entire system is right there. Look how far away you are from that. You're closer to that than the duct system is. All right? So if this unit is running and you don't have a water trap in here, you have a line like this, this thing is going to suck just like this. It's going to suck air because there's no trap into here. And if that's the primary drain, water ain't going to be able to get out because the pressure of the fan is going to be greater than the pressure of the water laying in that pan with no pump pushing it. This fan can develop, what, half an inch of water column? Easily. It might be, if it's variable speed, it might be capable of an inch and a half of water column. That means it can hold the column of water up in the air to a height of an inch and a half. So you got to be very careful here. In fact, your trap always has to be twice as deep as the static, possible static pressure that the fan could develop. So if you've got a fan that can develop inch and a half, this trap has to be at least three inches deep. If you don't trap the secondary drain, you're going to have the same problem. The problem is if you trap the secondary drain, how the heck are you going to keep it wet? Because that secondary drain is hardly ever used. So if you put a trap in there and you fill it with water like you should, then, you know, over the course of years, that water is going to evaporate and it's going to be open. So that creates a problem. What I would prefer you do would be to just take this, not run it outside, run it right into the pan. And that way you can always have the flow directly and then trap the line from the pan, the second line outside. The line outside from the secondary drain should be where people can see it. If this is a gutter, what we very often do is take this line, pitch it outside, put it inside the gutter where nobody has to look at it because the gutter is designed to handle water and the water will run off and drain out. Right? In the case of the secondary, you want to run it over top of the gutter so if there ever is water coming out of it, you tell the people, if you ever see water coming out of that pipe, call me immediately. We have a problem we must deal with immediately. A clogged or dirty air filter will cause inadequate heating and cooling and may lead to an ice block coil during the cooling season. No airflow goes over this coil. The, the refrigerant can't evaporate. The coil pressure drops, and so does the temperature. You're going to have ice on it. A float actuated switch in the primary drain pan will add to your, your, uh, your peace of mind if you're worried about overflowing water. If you put a float activated switch in there and break the Y leg going outside to the condenser across that switch, then any time there's too much water in this pan, you set it at the height you want, it'll cut out the outdoor unit. That's not going to give you more heating or cooling, but it's sure as heck going to get the homeowner's attention. And they're going to call you saying, hey, I got no heating or cooling, whatever the mode is. All right, probably going to be cooling. All right, let's talk about heat. You got two heats, just like you got two feet. So you got sensible heat, you got latent heat. Sensible heat is heat which, when added to a material, raises its temperature. That's inaccurate. It raises or lowers its temperature. I'm sorry, it's not inaccurate. When you add it, it raises it. When you remove it, it lowers it. Anytime you adjust, let's put it that way, the sensible heat, you adjust the temperature. Okay? You read sensible heat right on a thermometer, any, any dry bulb thermometer. Sensible heat can be measured with a dry bulb thermometer. All it is is an indication of intensity, heat's intensity. All right. Here's a meat thermometer. It reads dry bulb. 
Here's a uh, outdoor thermometer you probably have in your house. Uh, it reads outdoor uh, temperature and dry bulb. Latent heat, the other feat you have. Latent heat is heat which when added to a material changes its state but not its temperature. And it's not expressed in, everybody says, oh, the latent heat, that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, wet bulb temperature. It's not. That's an indication of the amount of latent heat you may or may not have in the air, but it's not. You measure latent heat in forms of BTUs per pound of material. In our case, BTUs per pound of air. And one pound of air is 13.33 cubic feet. If that air is standard air, 70 degree air at sea level, 50% relative humidity. Latent heat, what the heck are we talking about? Changes its state but not its material, uh, not its uh, temperature. Well, all things exist in three states, either one of three states, and not simultaneously. It's either solid, liquid, or vapor. Okay? Everything. I don't care what it is. Some things don't exist in all states. Wood is a solid. It can become a vapor when you burn it, but it's never a liquid. Not in our universe. Ice at 32 degrees and immediately melted ice, which is now water at 32 degrees, are the same temperature, but one's a solid and the other's a liquid. And, and in the case of ice, it took, let me jump to ice, it took 144 BTUs for every pound of ice that we melted to water at 32 degrees, somebody had to add 144 BTUs per pound of ice. Now, if we want to take a pound of water and freeze it at 32 to ice at 32, we need to remove 144 BTUs. In the case of water, hot water at 212 and steam at 212, one's a liquid, the other's a vapor, change of state, no change of temperature, 970 to as much as 1174 BTUs went into every pound of water that was converted to steam. You want to condense that steam back to 212 degree water? Remove 970 BTUs from it. And it will cool it off by 970 BTUs and that steam will condense right back to water. Okay? That's latent heat. You, it's latent. It's hidden. You can't see it. It's heat that's in the closet. It hasn't come out yet. It's very concerned that its mother will not appreciate it and his father might reject them. You know what I mean? Okay. Sensible heat ratio. What the heck is that? Sensible heat ratio is defined as the sensible heat. Of, you know, we use this sensible heat ratio in cooling, all right, mostly. The sensible heat ratio is the ratio of, let me show you the math, the sensible capacity divided by the total capacity of the cooling system. So... If the sensible capacity of a cooling system is 25,700 BTUs and the total capacity is 35,200, then my sensible heat ratio is 73%. Now, this is a three-ton unit, a nominal three-ton unit, but the sensible capability of this particular three-ton unit that I'm making up is 25,700. What that means is of the 35.2, I have 25.7 available to change the temperature in the room, to drop it from 80, whatever it is when I walk in, to 75. That's, this is the capacity I have to do that with with this particular machine because it has a 73% sensible heat ratio. The difference between 25.7 and 35.2 is latent heat, and that's how that's my capability to remove the moisture in the air. Okay, it's about uh, roughly 9,000 some BTUs. I have to remove the moisture in the air. So, go to the manufacturer's chart. You'll see sensible heat. You'll see total heat. All manufacturers will give you this for all of their products. Here's an old York. I'm not even sure they make this anymore. I took it out of an old York book I had. It's an H1RE036. It's a three-ton condenser. York tested in their environmental rooms 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different coils, evaporators, that could be matched with that one condenser. And what did they get? They got seven different sensible loads and seven different total loads. Now, look at this. When they match it up with the three -ton, this particular three-ton coil with that three-ton condenser, the sensible capacity is 24.5. The total is 34. When they match it up with this one, this is a three and a half ton evaporator, a particular three. And a, it goes from 25.4 to 28.4. They get 4,000 more BTUs to satisfy the temperature in the room. And look at the total. It only changed by 800. It went from 34 to 34.8. This is the way an HVAC professional picks a piece of equipment. He does a heat gain. Does a heat loss, manual J. He gets the size of his furnace. Then he does a heat gain, manual J. And he gets the size of the air conditioning system. The manual J will tell you what your sensible load is and what your latent load is. You take that information. You find this table because that's the series of units you're using. And you run down the column. Let's say you got a 27,000 BTU sensible gain. You can't use that. It only gives you 24.5. This is the only one in this series that you can use. And it means you got to use that coil. If you use this coil, you can't satisfy the load. When it's 95 degrees outside, if that's your design condition, you will not be able to maintain 75 inside if you chose this unit. But it doesn't show up till you get to 90, 95 outside. That's why a lot of people get away with it. Pray for, if you're choosing equipment based on total load, pray for mild summers. Pray that when it's really hot out, the people aren't in the building. They're somewhere else. They want a vacation or something. All right? Because otherwise your phone's going to ring off the hook whenever it gets up to 95. Sizing a heat pump. How do you size a heat pump? Well, very simple. Here's the procedure. You get ACA Manual J, the 8th edition out, or you get a computer that uses Manual J, like WriteSoft software, that kind of thing. Use ACA Manual J residential load calculation to determine the size of the system to install. The load calculation means you've done a heating load and a cooling load. Pick the system load based on the calculated cooling load. Then add auxiliary heat to make up for the deficit in the heating capacity. And if you're in Florida, you don't have a deficit. If you're in New Jersey, you're going to have a deficit. If you choose the system based on the heating load calculation you did, then the system will be grossly oversized for cooling, and you will constantly short cycle in the cooling uh, uh, situation and have no control whatsoever over the latent load because the unit, being so large sensibly, will satisfy the thermostat and shut off before all the moisture is evaporated. It won't run long enough to do the job. The whole dehumidification process is take the hot, damp, moisture-latent air, run it over a cold coil. Because you drop the temperature of the air, you drop its ability. You reduce its ability to hold moisture. And the moisture falls out of the air in the form of condensate. Bottom line, what are they going to ask you? What do you wh which value, heating, cooling, what? What do you use when you do a load calculation to pick a pump? You use the cooling value, the cooling load calculation. Let's talk about evacuation. Evacuation works like this. This device right here is called a compound gauge. All right? It's compound because it does two things. It measures pressures above atmosphere in pounds per square inch gauge, and it measures pressures below atmosphere in inches of mercury. The problem is it says it goes from 0 to 30 inches of mercury, and an absolute perfect vacuum is 29.92 inches of mercury. So if this thing could really tell me that were the case, I'd be delighted. You know as well as I do, all the manufacturers tell you in all their literature, if you've ever read it, that you need to get, when you're installing a new system, you need to evacuate it, heat pump, air conditioning, I don't care what it is, you need to evacuate it to a level of 500 microns. Here's the problem. This ain't microns. It's inches of mercury, which is a much broader scale. Now, you see this dial here, this, this needle? 
the smallest point of that needle, the width of that needle from left to right, is 3,000 microns wide. How the heck are you going to know when you're at 500 microns? This is not the device you use, a compound gauge mounted on your manifold. This simply tells you that you're in a vacuum. That's all. It cannot accurately tell you what that vacuum is. Now, if you're at sea level with me in Tampa and my house in Jersey near the shore, and you go 120 miles straight up with a column here, a uh, glass tube, and you have a scale at the bottom, and you weigh the, the weight of that 120 pounds of air directly above you, you will see that that air weighs 14.7 pounds. 14.7 pound is what you call... Let, let me give you this example, tell you this story. It's a whole lot easier to understand. If you're visiting me, and we're in the Gulf of Mexico in Tampa, and we're standing there with our ankles in low tide, and I hand you this gauge not connected to anything, and the gauge is not on zero, you're immediately going to stick a screwdriver in here and calibrate it till it says zero. And what you've done with that gauge not attached to anything is completely ignore 120 miles of air that weighs 14.696, 14.7 pounds. Understand that you did that. Now, when you attach this to your manifold set and attach your hoses to a system, and you get a reading of, let's say, 30 pounds, that's 30 pound gauge pressure because the gauge was calibrated at sea level. If I want to know what the absolute pressure was, you would say, oh, well, it's 30 pound gauge plus 14.7. It's what, 40, where am I? 44.7 pounds. It's 30 plus 14.7. So 30 pounds gauge pressure is equal to PSIG is equal to 44.7 PSIA, pound per square inch absolute, because 14.7 PSIA is equal to zero gauge. So when somebody gives you a gauge reading, and they will in a test, and they ask you to convert it to absolute PSIA, just add 14.7 to whatever the gauge reading is. If they give you an absolute reading, they say, uh, uh, I don't know, 15 pounds absolute is what gauge pressure, then just subtract 14.7 from the absolute reading and you'll have the gauge pressure. And you're going to have to do that on a test, so remember this. And remember the story. When you set this at zero gauge, you ignored the 14.7. So if you want to know what the absolute pressure, absolute being everything, the pressure in the system plus the atmosphere, the weight of the atmosphere, then you have to add them, the two together. So, I said 29.92 inches was a perfect vacuum. How do I know that? Well, I went in my backyard and I had a seesaw out there, a teeter-totter. And on this side, I put a 14.7 pound weight. In fact, it was exactly 14.696 pounds. And then I took a tube of mercury, and mercury is a heavy liquid. This isn't water. This is mercury. And I put it on the other side of the teeter-totter, and I got a pan of mercury, and I got up on a six-foot step ladder, and I started pouring the mercury in the tube. And when the, mer when the mercury in the tube got to a height of exactly 29.92 inches of mercury, this teeter-totter was dead level. 14.7 and t pounds and 29.92 inches of mercury weigh exactly the same thing. So when I've eliminated this weight from my system, that's what the compound gauge is supposedly telling you, I've eliminated the weight of the atmosphere and I have a perfect vacuum. Problem is, you can't read it. It's too small. Now here's a, an, an equation. When water boils at 212, it does so in an atmosphere that has a pressure of 29.92 inches. Your job in evacuation is to remove that pressure so it will boil at a, at a lower temperature. That 29.92, like I just showed you, is equal to 14.696 pounds per square inch pressure, which is equal to 759,968 microns. This is what science does. When we have a scale that's really small and we need to have a very, very small fraction of it, like here, one 
one three quarters of a millionth of it, all right, then we just make the scale bigger. All right, we say, okay, we're going to take this value and, and we're going to spread it over 759,000 parts. Now all we have to do, which is not all we have to do, it's the hard part, not the easy part, we've got to find an instrument that can measure it that accurately within a small scale like this. So, and if you look down here, you'll see that, yeah, one inch of mercury is equal to 25,400 microns. Okay? All right, so the manufacturer says we have to evacuate, and we have to evacuate down to 500 microns, right here between these two numbers. At 500 microns, water will boil at minus 12 degrees Fahrenheit. You got to interpolate here, but there's other scales that show you that a little more clearly. All right, it will water. So what we're doing, we're taking water at sea level, moisture that's in our system at sea level, and we create a vacuum in the system down to 500 microns, and that water will boil at a temperature of minus 12 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you could see inside the system, you would see the water if you collected it all in one place boiling like it was on a stove at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And when that water boils, now this vacuum pump can pull that vapor out. Because this vacuum pump can't pull anything. It could not pull the, it wouldn't be able to pull a drop of water half an inch. But a vapor, it can suck out. A single stage vacuum pump, and this ain't on a test, but just for your own information, a single stage vacuum pump, the best single stage vacuum pump money can buy, because it's single stage, can only pull a vacuum of 28 inches of mercury, which is equal to what? Right across here, about half a million microns. I'm sorry, about 700,000 microns. We got to go to 500. You can't do it with a single stage vacuum pump. It's impossible. I don't care if you triple evacuate quadruple evacuate, whatever you do, if this pump can only go to this value, there's no way in the world you're going to get down here. You need a two-stage pump. What's the first stage do? Takes you to 28 inches. What's the second stage do? Takes you as deep as you want to go, depending on how tight your fittings are and how clean your oil is. If there's water in your oil, you're not going to be able to pull it down. All right, because you're going to be trying to evaporate or vaporize the moisture in the oil. And that's going to take a lot of the pump's capacity. When you evacuate, cores in using a core removal tool like this. Look how open that is. All right. With the cores in or with the cores out, what do you do? Quarter inch hose or three eighths inch hoses that they recommend for vacuum. Uh, six, six foot long hoses or three foot long hoses. If you do all this, you will evacuate eight times faster. Eight times. That's five minutes instead of 40 minutes. That's half an hour instead of all morning. You get paid by the hour. If you don't care, you're not writing a check at the end of the week. Vacuum pump. Now, if you're going to use it, you've got to do some things. First of all, if you're going to use a micron gauge, it has to be surrounded by two valves. And the manufacturers sell these fittings. They're usually in a Y shape. I'm showing it linearly here. And it has two valves. One goes to the micron gauge. The other goes to the system. Now, what you do is when you first start this pump up for the first time, you're hooked up to the system, right? You close this valve off. And your micron gauge, if it's connected to this thermistor here, should pump right down. All right? It should go right down to 500 microns or below. It, that tells you, and, and, and it, it does, okay? So shut the pump off and see if it holds. If that 500 micron vacuum holds, that tells you two things. One, all your fittings are tight. And number two, there's no water in the oil. Okay? There might be acid in the oil, but there's no moisture in there. Because if there was, that would cause, after you shut the pump off and pull the 500 micron, it would cause the micron gauge to rise up to the thousands of microns. Once you've proved your oil and all that jazz is okay, run the unit. Then when you think you have the vacuum, close this valve off. Because as long as this valve is open, this micron gauge 
or thermistor, whatever you have here, is reading the pump, the inlet pressure to the pump. And that's not the pressure in the system where you're evacuating the moisture. So shut it off, close that valve off, shut your pump off, and watch your gauge. It'll do one of three things. It'll rise up continuously out of sight. Out of sight. And if it does, it'll go right up to 700,000 microns. All right. If it does, you got a leak in the system. Stop what you're doing. Go find the leak. Because you, all you're doing, if you continue to evacuate, is pull in damp air into your system. You're not eliminating moisture. You're creating it. The other thing it will do is rise up slowly and level off. You, your gauge here on your, that you're connected to says, oh, it's 500 microns. All right, valve it off. It will always expand and rise up. All, all gases will expand once you change the pressure. All right, it will rise up and level off. But it's not, if it's not where you want it to be, if it's not 500 microns, and if it lands around four or 5,000 microns, you probably have ice in the system if it levels off there. That's the vapor pressure of ice is around somewhere around three or 5,000 microns. You can look back on that chart, but that's not on a test, just for your own information. All right, but if it levels off at some value, let's say 3,000 microns, all that means is you're not done. There's no leaks because it leveled off, but you have 3,000 microns worth of moisture in there. Keep going, open this valve up, start it up again, let it run for a while, and then close it off. All right, the other thing it will do once you shut it off, it will expand a little bit and hit the level you want. It will be 500 microns or 1,000 microns, whatever you're uh, uh, evacuating to. Micron gauge. The use of a micron gauge is absolutely essential to proper evacuation of a refrigeration system to 500 microns in the field. If you're using a compound gauge to do that, you're guessing you have no idea what your vacuum is, or even if you if you have a small leak, it'll never show up in that compound gauge. How long are you evacuating? Oh, we evacuate through lunchtime. We let it go. We take a long lunch. We get a good deep vacuum. Not if you have a leak. And that ain't going to show it to you most of the time unless it's a huge leak. Sling psychrometer, 1940s technology. Two thermometers mounted on it right next to each other. One has a wetted wick on it. And as long as you keep that wick wet and the wick is clean and the water has good contact with the, the bulb on that, th uh, that thermometer, it will, and you whirl it around the world and in, uh, around in the room and you increase the evaporation rate by moving it around, it will evaporate the moisture that that it can relative to the humidity in the air and it will drop the temperature of the dry bulb to the point where it's taking all the moisture out. This is the wet bulb depression, the difference between the wet bulb and the dry bulb and the greater that difference is, the drier the air is. It simply means that the air you whirl this around in has the capacity to absorb more moisture because the more moisture it absorbs, the lower the dry bulb temp or the wet bulb temperature goes. You can't change the temperature of the air by, with a dry bulb. can't do it. You can move it all day long, and you're not going to change the temperature of the, the dry bulb temperature of the air by moving it. It's not possible. If the, the, the closer the wet bulb and dry bulb are, the more moisture is in the air. If the, the air is 100% moist, it's raining, and you're in a fog, whatever the case is, is 100% relative humidity, it can't absorb any moisture and the wet bulb and dry bulb would be the same temperature. An instrument commonly used to measure the amount of moisture in the air is the sling psychrometer. This instrument can, consists of two liquid and glass thermometers. One thermometer measures the air temperature, dry bulb, while the other thermometer measures wet bulb temperature. After the wick is dipped in distilled water, okay, that's why I don't like this. Nobody carries distilled water around in a truck. The sling psychrometer is whirled around using the handle. Water evaporates. Here's the handle. The water evaporates from the wick on the wet bulb thermometer and cools the thermometer due to the latent heat of vaporization. It takes the heat out of the mercury in the thermometer. The wet bulb thermometer is cooled to the lowest value possible in a few minutes. This value is known as the wet bulb temperature. 
When do you stop stop whirling this thing around in the air? When do you do that? When the wet bulb temperature stops dropping. There is no amount of time. If it, you know, you start out at 80 degrees and it drops to 70 and 60 and you keep whirling and you stop and you check it and it's 60 and you whirl again and you stop and you check it's 60, okay, your wet bulb's 60. All right? But not if it, if it keeps dropping. The drier the air, the more, thermo the more the thermometer cools and hence the lower the wet bulb temperature. And the lower the wet bulb temperature, the drier the air. Damp places like uh, North Jersey, uh, uh, you know, along the shore, uh, like uh, Tampa, Florida, where I live, uh, your wet bulb temperatures are always in the 70s. If you're real dry, you're out in the desert, your wet bulb temperatures are down like in the 50s. COP, what the heck is COP? Coefficient of performance. Here is the formula for coefficient of performance. And they're going to ask you this in the test. What it is, COP is equal to the heat pump output in BTUs per hour divided by the heat pump input, the energy usage that went into creating those BTUs in the form of kilowatt hours multiplied by 3413. When you take a 10 kilowatt hours and multiply it by 3413, what are you getting? The BTUs that went into making the BTUs. So what you have here is the perfect formula for efficiency. Any efficiency of any mechanical equipment is measured by dividing the output, the useful output, by the input. And that's what we've done here. We've converted our electrical input to BTUs and we've divided it into the BTU output of the system during the, during the heating season. All right? That's COP, coefficient of performance. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, these are the last sets of questions because this is the last section. So let's get to it, and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit in the end about how to prepare for the exam. Q&A time. All right, numero uno. The primary function of a reversing valve is to improve the flow of refrigerant, divert hot gas to the indoor coil, divert hot gas to the outdoor coil, switch between heating and cooling. Yeah, man, that's what it's going to do. I mean, it might be hot gas, indoor, outdoor, whatever, depending on the season. It certainly doesn't improve the flow of refrigerant, but it definitely switches between heating and cooling. Two, a typical four-way reversing valve has three ports on one side of the valve body and a single port on the opposite side of the valve body. To what is this single port connected? The return line, the discharge line, the accumulator, the liquid line. What's that single port, that single way connected to? Yeah, man, discharge line. Three. Of the three ports on one side of the reversing valve's body, to what is the center port connected? Return line, discharge line, accumulator, liquid line. What do you think here? Now think about this one. Accumulator. Return line? The return line's coming back from one of the coils. It ain't connected to that. If there's an accumulator in a line, it'll be directly connected to that. Some manufacturers don't use accumulators. At least they don't supply them from the factory. Uh, you may have a situation where you have to add one, but they don't come from the factory that way. But if they do, and most of the manufacturers have accumulators, then you're going to hook this up to the accumulator. All right? The true suction line is going to be between the accumulator and the compressor. It's not the return line. The return line is the line that comes back from the coil. Four, if a heat pump system is low on charge, then the reversing valve is less likely to slide, will slide on its own, will continually slide back and forth. Charge has no effect on the operation of a reversing valve. What's your pleasure here? Yeah, if you're low on charge, it's less likely to, to slide. Okay? you got to have the pressure it takes to push that slide across that Teflon. Five, if the reversing valve is leaking under the slide, then A, the valve will only slide one way. The valve will get hung up at midpoint. 
a high pressure will fill the entire valve body. The pressures will tend to equalize. What do you think here? What, what happens when you get a leak under the slide? Yeah, your pressures are going to equalize for sure. Six, most defrost requirements occur at what outdoor temperature? At any temperature below 32, between 35 and 45, between 45 and 55, this can occur at any outdoor temperature. What do you think here? At what point will you need to go into defrost? Yeah, you know, that, that's very common. It, it could happen in here too. All right, it definitely could happen in here. Um, in fact, I'm not sure, to be honest with you, that's not a better answer. But uh, how about this one? This can occur at any outdoor temperature. Well, some units it can, but, you know, depending on, the, on how it's uh, set up at the factory. But I'll tell you right here, at any of these temperatures, that coil is definitely going to be below freezing. All right, if I take 10 degrees off of 55, it's down to 45, and you don't need defrost. So on second thought, this is not a great one. In fact, here, 45, if I remove 10 degrees to the outdoor coil, it's 35. So... Of all these choices, this is certainly the better answer. Not that defrost can't happen at 45. Obviously, it can. But this is more, this is a better answer. Okay? That's the way you want to look at these questions on the exam. Okay? Seven. The ambient temperature sensor for a heat pump's defrost system should be located. Where do you put the ambient temperature sensor? In the inlet airstream to the outdoor unit? in the discharge airstream from the outdoor unit, at least three feet away from the outdoor unit, in the shade at least three feet away from the outdoor unit. What do you think? Yeah, in the inlet airstream. If you want to know what the temperature of the air entering the unit is, that's where you put it. Eight, if a heat pump defrost system is initiated by temperature difference, then as the outdoor coil ices up, the temperature difference increases to initiation. The temperature difference decreases to initiation. The ice and air temperatures are the same. If the ice and air temperatures are the same, then it's going to go into defrost, or defrost is initiated at a predetermined time period only. If you got temperature sensitive, what happens? Yeah, temperature difference increases to the point where it's so high the the pressure that it initiates defrost. Nine, if a heat pump's defrost system is initiated by pressure difference, then as the outdoor coil ices up, the pressure difference increases to initiation, the pressure difference decreases to initiation, the pressures are the same, the defrost is initiated, defrost is initiated at a predetermined time period only. Same answer. As it increases, you go into initiation, whether it's temperature or pressure. When the ice builds up in a coil, either the temperature difference and or the pressure differences are going to increase. Ten. Once defrost is initiated, what else usually happens? The outdoor fan is shut off. The reversing valve is switched to the cooling mode. Emergency heat strips are energized. All of the above. What do you think? Yeah, man, all the above. And all the above answer on a test is kind of a gimme. Because if you see, you know for sure two things happen, and you don't have an option of saying A and C, for instance, then all the above has got to be the. You don't even have to know that the third thing can happen. But be sure that you know those two things can happen. All right? Before you make that logical choice. <clears throat> 11. The balance point of a heat pump can best be described as... The point at which both the heat loss and the heat gain are equal. The point at which it is most economical to use the heat pump alone as opposed to the electric resistance heat. The point at which the building's heat loss equals the heat pump's ability to produce heat, provide heat. Or D, the point at which the building's heat gain equals the heat pump's ability to provide cooling. What do you think the balance point is? Yeah, the point at which the building's heat loss equals the heat pump's ability to provide heat. 
12. The outdoor unit must be located so that roof runoff is avoided, defrost water can drain away, it is elevated above snow drifts. You know what this is going to be, all of the above. That's a gimme question, all right? You should know that. 13. Packaged heat pumps are more expensive than split systems, less expensive than split systems, lightweight and easy to handle, made out of high carbon steel. What do you think? Yeah, they're less expensive. 14. The single most important consideration for a packaged heat pump to be mounted on a roof is what's the single most important what what thing should occur to you first when you look at a roof and you say oh I got to put a heat pump package heat pump up here can the roof support the weight of the unit to be sure that you choose a unit with the same voltage to be sure that you choose a unit with the same duct connections as the old system that was there to choose a unit of the same or greater BTU value. If you're replacing a unit on a roof, don't assume that because it's the same size, same voltage, it has the same weight. Okay? And that, in fact, the roof can support that weight. Maybe that unit never ran. That, that part of the building was never occupied and it had no moving load. The result is, and the answer it should be obvious, and the result is it had no vibration, so it had no real load attached to it. Now you come in, you get rid of that thing because it sat there for five years in an unoccupied building. You put a new one on, you start it up, it starts to move and shake and vibrate. There goes the roof because you didn't take a look at the roof. Make no assumptions. It's okay to assume something if the unit's been in operation and you know the weight of the old unit relative to the new unit. But myself, I don't take chances. It costs too much in the in the form of money, embarrassment, and loss of reputation to be wrong. To avoid noise transmission from a packaged heat pump on the roof, be sure to wrap the ductwork, be sure to line the ductwork, be sure to install the curb gasket, avoid the use of curb gaskets. How are you going to avoid noise transmission? Yeah, man, curb gasket. On a typical two-stage heat pump thermostat, the first stage brings on the heat pump and the second stage energizes the first stage of auxiliary heat, the air handler, the compressor, the outdoor thermostat circuit. What's the second stage do on a two-stage thermostat and a heat pump? Brings the first stage of auxiliary heat on. 17. If the thermostat system switch is set to auto, the system switch is auto, then the fan will come on automatically when needed. The system will automatically go into cooling. The system will automatically go into heating. The system will automatically go into either heating or cooling as the demand indicates. You betcha. 18. Why do some thermostats have C terminals on their sub bases that must be connected? The manufacturer says, use this thermostat, it's got a C terminal, bring the other side of power up there. Why are you doing that? The reason is, uh, this terminal is used when the power is lost. This terminal is used to change the uh, charge the battery backup. Both sides of power are required to light lights and the display. Both sides of power are required to pull in all of the relays. Why? What, what's the most common reason for doing that? What's the best answer here? Yeah, you, you need to light the lights and the display. It tells you what the temperature is and what mode you're in and all that jazz. All right? You either got a, both sides of the transformer up or you got a battery in there doing it, one of the two. 19. The heating anticipator is set to match the amp draw of the cooling circuit to match the amp draw of the heating circuit, to anticipate the need for cooling, to bring the fan on before a call for heat. What's the heating anticipator do? Well, what's it set? To match the amp draw of the heating system. All right, you can't adjust it in the cooling. It's not an option. All right. <clears throat> 20. An add-on heat pump requires the addition of a control that will add-on heat pump will 
cause a fan delay on a call for heat. Cause a fan delay at the end of a call for cooling. Not allow the heat pump and the furnace to operate simultaneously in the heating mode. Or keep the second stage and first stage from operating simultaneously in the cooling mode. What does what control do you need on an add-on heat pump? You need something that's not going to allow the heating, the heat pump, and the furnace to operate at the same time. Because you'll create very, very, very hot refrigerant. And that's going to create a problem in the unit that's trying to run. Going to have high head pressure. 21. Why would a low pressure switch be placed in the low side of a heat pump? To sense low oil pressure? To sense low condenser airflow, to sense a loss of charge, or to sense low outdoor temperature. What do you use a low pressure switch for? Yeah, check loss of charge, which is low pressure. 22. Electronic air cleaners. Improve IAQ, removes most airborne contaminants, operated voltages in excess of 5,000 volts DC, all of the above. Yeah, man, all of the above. I still think all of the above questions are gimmies. But 23, an electronic air cleaner cannot remove odors, pet hair, pollen, smoke. What can an electronic air cleaner not remove? Can't remove odors. They do remove smoke and other gases, CO2, that kind of thing. Irritants from carpets, formaldehyde, that kind of thing. They'll take it right out of the air. 24, as an air cleaner begins to become clogged, it becomes less efficient, it becomes more efficient, its resistance decreases, it will cause the fan to stall. As an air cleaner begins to clog, what happens? Yeah, it becomes more efficient. Smaller space because of the clogging. You can take out smaller particles. That's higher efficiency. 25. An untrapped condensate drain line that is located on the inlet side of a blower will not allow the water to drain from the pan until the fan shuts off. Force the water out of the pan under high pressure. Cause the pan to overflow on the off cycle will have no effect on proper drainage. Yeah, if it's on the negative side, it's going to be pulling negative air in, and it's not going to allow the drain pan to drain while the fan is on. When the fan shuts off, it'll drain fine. 26. What will mitigate the damages associated with the problems encountered in the last question? Mitigate means reduce. Okay. What's going what's gonna to make smaller damages here? All right, less damage. A condensate pump, will that help the situation out when you, where you don't have a trap? An inverted P-trap, a float-activated switch in the drain pan, or, or greater pitch on the drain pan. Which one of these is going to help that situation? A float-actuated act switch that will shut the unit off if the, if the uh, level in the drain pan rises too high. And it will shut the unit off, and the unit will stop making condensate, and the pan won't overflow. All right? It will stop making condensate because it ain't running anymore. All right? 27. Sensible heat is heat that causes the change of state but no change in temperature. Heat that causes a change in a dry bulb temperature. Heat that causes water to become steam. Heat that causes ice to become water. What is sensible heat? It's heat that causes a change in the dry bulb temperature. Okay? That's all. It's that simple. Temp temperature changes, goes up, goes down. It's a sensible change. 28. Latent heat can be measured using a dry bulb thermometer, a wet bulb thermometer, a hygrometer. Sounds good, don't it? Hygrometer. None of the above. Ah, this is a time when maybe none of the above or all of the above was a little head fake. So that became a good distractor here. A lot of people will bite on hygrometer. Hygrometer measures the density of the water. Okay? You see hygro, you think, oh, water. You know? No, don't jump on that one. Remember, uh, latent heat is measured in BTUs per pound of dry air. Sensible heat ratio is 
sensible heat divided by latent heat, sen uh, latent heat divided by sensible heat, sensible heat divided by total heat, total heat divided by sensible heat. Now you get a question like this, you want to get away. You just read all the possibilities. Now think about what you know. Think, okay, sensible heat. What did that goofy old guy that made that CD say? He said sensible heat was sensible heat, uh, the sensible heat ratio was sensible heat divided by total heat. Okay, so just run down here, sensible heat divided by, no, sensible heat divided by, that's it. That's the one I want. That's the way you want to answer a question like that. Because this will, this will make you cross-eyed, reading four distractors like that. 30. After using ACA's Manual J to calculate the heat loss and heat gain of a residential structure, you will then use which of the following to choose a heat pump? The sensible heat ratio, the COP, the heat loss, the heat gain. Of those, how we, which one of these are you going to use to choose a heat pump? Yeah, man, heat gain. Then add resistance to make up for the heat loss. Then go find yourself a good heat pump with a COP value that uh, you can live with. 31. A gauge reading of 30 PSIG equates to 0 PSIA, 15.3 PSIA, 44.7 PSA, PSIA, or none of the above. What's the answer here? Yeah, 30 plus 14.7 is 44.7. I think I used that example when we were going over the slides earlier, and I just I forgot it was in here as a question. All right. 32. An evacuation of a split system heat pump is considered complete at five, 500 microns, 30 inches of mercury on a compound gauge, 20 millimeters of mercury, HG is the um, atomic symbol for mercury, or 29.92 inches of water column. When is a heat pump considered to be properly evacuated. 500 microns. All right. This is if this were 29.92 inches of mercury, you know, it would be correct, but not in a compound gauge. It's not mercury. It's water column, and mercury is a heck of a lot heavier than water is. Two completely different scales. After the vacuum pump is isolated from the system. The mercury gauge rises to a level of 7,500 microns and stays there. What does this indicate? You shut the pump off, you isolated the pump from the system, and your mercury gauge, your micron gauge, rises up to 700, uh, 7,500 microns. Wait, what's it mean? There's a leak in the system. There's ice in the system. There's moisture in the system. The evacuation process is complete. What does this tell you? There's moisture in the system. You ain't done yet. Keep going. Start it up. Get it down to 500. 34. If the wet bulb and dry bulb temperatures are the same, what does this indicate? Very dry air. 100% relative humidity. 50% relative humidity. The need to purchase a new psychrometer. Yeah. It's raining. Or you're in a fog, or uh, something is up. You have extremely high relative humidity. It's as high as it goes. The air is 100% of the air is saturated. So relative to whatever temperature you're at, the air is 100% saturated. You can't put any more water in that air. It simply will not absorb it. It's saturated. That's what 100% relative humidity means. 35. COP is derived by. Input KW divided by output KW. This is one of those questions. Cooling input divided by cooling output. Heating input divided by heating output. Heating heat pump output in BTUs divided by the input kilowatt times 3413. What's the answer? That should look familiar because we just talked about that. Useful output in BTUs divided by input in BTUs. And taking the kilowatt... And and multiplying it by 3413 gives you BTUs. All right? So it's output BTU divided by input BTU is the bottom line. 36. 
To properly prepare to sit for the Nate exam, one must get a good night's sleep the night before the exam. Don't come into this exam tired. You won't be nearly as sharp or as logical as you need to be. Sell the kids to the gypsies, divorce the wife, get to bed early. Have a good meal, eat a lot of high protein, it will help the brain the next day. Protein takes 12, 14 hours to break down. You'll still have it the next morning. All right. Eat a good breakfast. Don't not eat. Eat a good breakfast. Feed that engine inside your body. Get the blood moving, your metabolic rate up, and go take the exam. Don't spend too much time on any one question. Don't do it. You're gonna have, if you're going to take 150 questions, 100 in the specialty and 50 in the core, you have 6, 12, 18, 240 minutes, 4 hours, to answer 150 questions. That's around 2 minutes a question. That's a lot of time, but you can't spend 5 minutes on any one question for two reasons. One, it will cause you to become very negative and you'll start moving the wrong juices through your body, the more wrong endorphins, you'll become depressed. And when you become depressed, the brain stops working well. Do you know any really sharp, accurate, depressed people? Okay, get what I'm saying? Get a good night's sleep. Make sure you don't spend too much time. Here's the way you take a test. And I, I am the expert on exams. In my lifetime, high school, college, uh, CMS, CM, CMS, CM certifications, NATE certifications. I've taken 10 Gogzian exams, proctored exams, okay? Start at question one and read through the end and only answer the questions you know cold. You, are, you wouldn't change this answer for all the money in the world. You know it's right. Any question you get to and you answer just those questions. When you come up on question 18, I'm making up a number, and you say, geez, I don't know, it could be C and it could be D. I'm really not sure. Let me think. Nah, screw it. Leave it. Go, go to 19. And come back to it when you're all done. Remember, out of 100 questions, you can get 30 wrong and still pass. And out of 50, you can get 15 wrong and still pass. So come back, look at the questions you didn't answer, and count them up. If there's 20 questions out of 100 you didn't answer and no cold, don't sweat it. Even if you don't answer them, you can't fail. All right? But don't take that chance. Don't be foolish. They might have the wrong answer for the question. You might, although you're 100% convinced, you might be wrong. So don't take that chance. But at least now know, okay, I can relax. I don't have to, how can I, I got to get this in? You don't have to do that. You're ahead of the game. So now go back, look at those questions again, and you may find that while you were answering the rest of the questions, one of them had the answer to the question you didn't answer. That very often happens when you see a question formed in the form of a statement, okay? Uh, and then they ask you a question about that statement. They may have forgotten it earlier on. They asked you a question about that statement, and then they just gave you the answer, all right? So handle it that way. Bring your Nate ID number to the exam, or is the answer to this question all of the above? It almost always is all of the above. <laughs> all right, guys, gals, whoever I'm talking to, obviously I don't know that. Good luck on this exam. But don't let this be the thing that gets you through it. That's always a nice thing to have in your side and in your pocket. But your expertise, your willingness to study and, and keep reviewing this material and asking questions and reading other sources until it makes sense is the important thing. If at any point in time with this exam or anything else in the industry you think that I might be able to help you out, don't hesitate to contact me. Go to my website. It's the fastest way to get all the 411 on me. The website is www. Uh, HV, I almost forgot my own website, uh, HVACtechnicaltraining.com. And if you don't fall asleep by the time you're done typing that out, you can go in there and you'll find my phone numbers for Jersey and for Florida. You'll find my email address. You'll find my everything you want to know about me. And there ain't a whole lot to know about me, and none of it is exciting. So 
It's all in there. But if you think I can help you, shoot me an email. I'm not always sitting by the phone. I will always get back to you. But if you give me an email, I'll check my email every night, even when I'm out of town. But the phone calls, I may not get to till I get back in town or get to a place where I can make that phone call. But the email, I'm a whole lot more responsive uh, for obvious reasons. Even when I'm in the airport, I, I, I have email access. So good luck. Stay well. Thank you for buying this CD. We appreciate your interest. We hope it helps you. I want to thank uh, uh, Craig Gothard here at uh, ACCA, ACCA National, who comes in early, who stays late, who is the technical genius behind this production, who's actually going to make the copies as you guys require them. And uh, he's done, uh, I owe this guy big time. All right. Um, uh, Kevin Holland, whose idea this whole thing was, uh, who runs the, uh, I guess you could say, the business end of the business. Kevin thought of this idea, thought it would be a great idea, and asked me to help him do it, and I think we get a good product here. And from here, we're going to go forward. Craig, Kevin, myself, we're going to go forward. We're going to, the next thing we're going to come out with is stuff for the service guys, the core for installation and air conditioning installation, and we're going to go back and forth between service and heat pump, service and uh, gas heating, service and cooling, and we're going to do all the specialties that Nate offers over time. But if you bought this CD, you bought the very first set we made, which was the core for service and the, the uh, specialty exam for heat pumps. All right. So, again, thank you. Stay well.